Um, this evening's discussion uh, is faith along the Bodhisattva path. Um, you know, I like to set lofty goals, <laughs> as if this is an easy topic to, to jump into. Um, and, and faith is not an easy conversation to have um, all the time. Um, it's often tough, and particularly because one's faith is usually seen as one's own. Um, and anyone telling you to hold faith in one way or another can push buttons, as it were. Um, and rather than discuss why you might feel those buttons being pushed, um, for I don't wish to admonish or praise any particular viewpoint about faith per se, I do want to instead gear the conversation um, towards uh, distinctions in a uh, Buddhist notion of faith, um, how important that distinction uh, might be, and how faith aids one down the bodhisattva path. Um, so I will start with a uh, some clarification of terms. Uh, thank you, Kaiden. Um, first, a distinction between belief and faith. Uh, as Mochi Sensei has described it to me, belief is that which you you uh, which you are told about, and you tend to hold true. Um, faith on the other hand, is the experience of that belief. And thus, a, a validation, uh, a validating of the belief in a more embodied way. Um, faith is a translation of the word shraddha, um, which originates from the roots of shrat, to have conviction, um, and da, to uphold. And the word prasada um, derives from the prefix pra, and the root sad, which means to sink or settle down, to sit. Um, the former relates to our confidence, our steadfastness, and trust. And the latter is more effective, uh, referring to how, particularly through rites and rituals, uh, we can be firmly seated in a state of equanimity. As Rupert Gethin puts it, faith has two characteristics. Um, it causes the mind to, be, uh, to become uh, settled and composed, and it inspires it with the confidence to leap forward. From this, our, our faith can deepen, grow, and continue to support our path towards awakening. However, um, Kanze, uh, Epo Kanze makes the distinction uh, for more uh, modern times that this skeptical age dwells anyway far too much on the intellectual side of faith. Shraddha, the word we render as faith, is more entomologically akin to Latin core, the heart. And faith is, is, and therefore faith is much more a matter of the heart than the intellect. And historically, uh, early Buddhism focused on faith being placed on the triple gems, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Um, this already makes a vast distinction between many other religions since there is no god deity at the center of, um, uh, of that faith. One might argue that Shakyamuni Buddha might, be, uh, might have been worshipped in this way, and undoubtedly um, that is true, but more often than not, it is his characteristics, his representation of the awakened mind that has, held, that has been held in such high esteem. And besides, he's just a person, one who accomplished many things, and was an example for others of what was possible. Taking refuge, therefore, was an in initial expression of one's faith and, and a determination to follow the Buddhist path. This, in turn, can open one up um, to new spiritual experiences, previously <laughs> unknown to them, in that the value of taking refuge is rooted in personal verification. This personal verification is discussed in the, in the Kalama Sutta, where the Buddha goes to great lengths to describe that one should not uh, follow religious authority, tradition, doctrine, um, or respecting teachers for the mere fact that they're one's teachers, and instead should find out whether a teaching is true by personal verification of spiritual truth instead, distinguishing what leads, uh, what leads to happiness and benefit and what does not. Therefore, faith goes hand in hand 
with a willingness to open oneself, learn, try to figure out, familiarizing oneself with the teaching. Again, here, the emphasis on, is on one's own experience of that teaching. As Mahayana developed, faith started to play a larger role within religious practice. That is to say, the further we got from Shakyamuni Buddha's death, the more practitioners sought um, to experience the Buddha um, and awakening. And the more the Triple Gem was expanded to encompass focusing on heavenly Buddhas, such as Amida Buddha in Pure Land Buddhism, or uh, Avalokiteshvara, uh, Bodhisattvas, including Bodhisattvas. Um, Certain sutras, like the Lotus Sutra, um, became the main focus of faith. And for schools like Chan and Zen, Buddhism, the concept of the Tathagata Garva can be seen as central to their faith. This distinction between early Nikaya Buddhism and its long evolution to what now Mahayana is, uh, what is now Mahayana is obviously generalized. And, and there are certainly examples um, that refute this. But overall, the reliance on faith took a greater meaning um, as the movement away from one's own awakening was directed more towards the unification with the absolute, the universal Buddha nature. This is at the heart of the Bodhisattva path, a realization of the nature of dukkha and the samsaric state, and the perseverance towards awakening of all sentient beings. This breadth of faith within the Mahayana is most succinctly expressed in the awakening of faith, attributed to Ashvagosa, a first or second century North Indian author and philosopher. Um, it exists only in Chinese, um, and since Ashvagosa only ever wrote in Sanskrit, uh, there has been quite a amount of debate about its origins. Um, and then there are only um, two historical uh, early versions found in Chinese. Um, <clears throat> uh, and a lot of consideration about how to translate such a text has been given. The, the first is traditionally thought to have been translated by Paramartha in uh, 550 CE. I should say CE there, sorry for the um, exclusion of that. And the second being an alleged retranslation by Sheikh uh, Sananda between 695 and 700 CE. Despite the current debate at the time, um, despite the current debate at the time, the, the text provided the foundation for many of the forms of East Asian, um, uh, East Asian schools, namely, namely Hua Hian, Chan, Xingon, and more indirectly, um, the Tiantai school. It, it brings together the doctrines of the uh, Tathagata Garbha with the Yogacara model. Um, of consciousness. It's a very concise explanation of interpenetration. It states that one inherently is awakened, um, but is veiled by ignorance, which is the source of conceptual, dualistic thought and phenomena. But because it is essentially unsullied, we can shine through this ignorance and purify the mind. And so the text offers a way to transcend the mundane while remaining within it. Uh, Yoshito Hakeda, the translator of the particular um, volume I used, uh, first published by Columbia Press and then reprinted by the BDK, uh, the Numata Center in Berkeley, um, he uses the early Paramarta version and, uh, of the translation and through, throughout the entire text goes to great lengths to elaborate this extremely short, um, to-the-point discourse in order to provide context. Uh, he even describes it as terse. Um, it, but it, it, in all, it's about nine pages, um, but with his commentary throughout, um, in which he elucidates many of the, the um, passages, it gets to about uh, the text itself, um, about 45 pages. So comparatively, a lot of commentary within it. Um, but he explains that the, 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 that the text um, begins with the explanation, examination of the nature of the absolute or enlightenment and of the phenomenal world, or non-enlightenment, and discusses the relationship that exists between them. From there, it, is, it passes on to the question of how human beings may transcend their finite state 
and participate in the life of the infinite while still remaining in the midst of the phenomenal world. Um, it concludes with a discussion of particular practices and techniques that will aid the believer in awakening the growth of his faith. So for Hakeda, this in, a, it, in and of itself is the explanation of the, of the, whole, um, of the whole discourse. And as kind of complex as the first sections may be, based on the nature of explaining interpenetration um, and the oneness of mind, the final sections are comparatively straightforward. Um, he ex uh, Ashvagosa, supposedly, um, explains the, the necessity for four the four faiths. Um, and they are faith in the ultimate uh, source, suchness, and then faith in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, the triple, uh, the triple gems. Um, he then uh, 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 slide, please, yes, thank you. Um, he then lists the five practices that will aid in developing and perfecting these faiths. First is charity, then observance of the precepts, patience, zeal, and this is together cessation of illusions and clear observation. So charity being these are all fairly self-explanatory. Um, it's the charity is the free giving of oneself. Um, for the benefit of another, without the preconceived notion that something's going to be returned. So that's free giving. Observance of the precepts, wholeheartedly following one's vows, not to kill, steal, commit adultery, slander, lie, to be free from greed, uh, jealousy, cheating, <clears throat> anger, hatred, etc. Zeal, not to be sluggish in doing of good. Firm in resolution. And a purge of cowardice. I love that purge of cowardice. Um, in order to temper Mara and to overcome lifetimes of hindrances. And then the cessation of illusions and clear observation. Succinctly, Shimatsu and Vipassana. But as Ashwagosa puts it, putting a stop to all characteristics of the world of sense objects and of the mind because it means to follow shamatha method of meditation. What is called clear observation means to perceive distinctly the characteristics of the causally conditioned phenomena, samsara, because it means to follow the vipassana method of meditation. Well, I mean, to me, simply put, uh, it seems like the Eiffel Path, the Paramitas, um, Kind of anticlimactic. I was expecting a whole lot. Um, but on the other hand, this is so profound because this is what it takes for one to start to develop one's faith. But if distinctly, it is to put the Eightfold Path, Six Paramitas, etc., into action. He does, he does go on um, to provide a little bit more detail and context for the meditation practice, the, the cessation of illusions and clear observation, but more as a per, per, uh, for perspective rather than a how-to. But that's it, to live the path and faithfully okay. grow. This is at the heart of the Mahayana and the Bodhisattva path. Learn the teachings and put them into your life. Again, it's the experiential as a means of personal validation. Please. Put quite beautifully, Ashwagosa quotes, why is it that people do not meditate on their own accord on suchness alone, but must learn to practice good deeds? Just as a precious gem is bright and pure in its essence, but is married by impurities, so is a human being. Even if a person meditated on his precious nature, unless he polishes it in various ways by expedient means, he will never be able to purify it. Regardless of how simply put, the fact is that we have a really hard time with the profundity of that simplicity. Often the difficulty we face when our mundane selves get in the way of our sense of the absolute. We may want to follow the path, act in accordance, etc., but when push comes to shove, do we? I might make the distinction about the level of faith, sure, but here, again, 
this text states that by the doing, it continually grows. It's a perpetuation, a, a, a deepening with each experience, and each experience, with each experience, a willingness and confidence to leap forward, as Geffen puts it. But this gets to an issue of modern times. We have become reliant on rationalism. I might even, uh, in, in Sensei and I have discussed, even psychoanalytic thought, which by its very nature is dictated by a sullied, conditioned intellect. Slide, please. Sanrakshita describes it as such. There has been, in recent times, a considerable reaction against anything that smacks of faith and devotion. This has been, in part, caused by the fact that popular faith has been divorced from what I have termed the higher thinking faculty, and so become unacceptable to the intellect, bringing the whole notion of faith and devotion into disrepute, and, and along it, with the practice of ritual, but unfortunately, it has to be said that the re rejection of faith, devotion, and ritual is for most people not the result of their own earnest and searching intellectual endeavor. More often than not, it is just a received view, a part of their conditioning which has no more intellectual legitimacy than blind faith, which they look down upon. Then Gethin says, I, I think you went. Oh, far. sorry. One more? You went one, one too many. Yep, go back. Go back. <laughs> go back one more. more. There you go. There it is. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> without some initial trust in the fact that there is a way out of suffering, without some seed of understanding of the nature of suffering and cessation, we would never begin to look for the path. And we, would, and we would have no hope of finding it. Faith or confidence in the Buddha, his teachings, and the community of those who have followed and realized the teaching is the starting point for the Buddhist path that is assumed both by the earliest texts and by those brought up in traditional Buddhist cultures today. Yet those of us whose sensibilities may have been molded by a more recent Western intellectual traditions are often uncomfortable in the presence of religious faith and its devotional and ritual expression. The Buddhist understanding of faith is almost entirely effective. In other words, Buddhist texts understand faith in the Buddha and Dharma not so much as a matter of intellectual assent to certain propositions, but about the world in the form of a Buddhist creed, but as the state of trust, confidence, affection, and devotion inspired by the person of the Buddha and his teachings. What, what I hope I was able to bring to the discussion today is simply a perspective that may help us become more aware of our own personal relationship with the Buddhist teachings, our faith, or lack thereof, and to call attention to the fact that we cannot think our way through it. If we are to follow the Bodhisattva path, stealing from Job, we have to allow the Bodhicitta to take the lead. We have to allow that seed of awakening to lead us forth. And should consider our, how our self, how our ego, our intellect, our dukkha, gets in the way of how we better, uh, how we are more able to fully experience and embody the Buddha Dharma. Um, before I open it up to comments and discussions and things, um, Monshin Sensei, Ichishima Sensei, um, are there other aspects of faith that you might want to bring up in this? At this point? No, I'll, I'll leave it where it is. Ichishima Sensei, did you have something that you wanted to, to add to that? Yeah, thank you. Well, faith is very important uh, in any religions. I think, especially in Buddhism, uh, faith is discussed by many uh, predecessors, uh, and such as Shindan, also in Japanese, uh, pure and worship, 
with this is one. And uh, many other people, they are discussing about the pace. Yes. I think pace is very uh, important and uh, basic uh, understanding uh, to the region, I think. Uh, but pace consists of, I think, uh, three uh, tools like uh, Chintamayi, thinking, uh, uh, and Shirutamayi, uh, <clears throat> hearing or learning, and then Bhavanamayi, uh, which is uh, practicing <laughs> wisdom, will. So these three are also discussed in various sutras. Uh, especially, I found that uh, Sri uh, Chintamani, uh, <coughs> such a, a basic uh, run. What, 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 uh, before we go into face, we have to think about it, whether this is truth or not. Then, and also, of course, Shruttama is hearing from various uh, teachers. And then if you convince uh, th those uh, words you have received, uh, whether it is uh, true or not, examine by text. Then if you decided, oh, this is true, then we can go into pace. This is a real uh, pace. Uh, for instance, Bhavana Krama by Kamrashira. Uh, eighth centuries Indian philosopher, he mentioned about it. That is my understanding and comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, Sensei. Um, so, Kari, can you the next slide there? Um, and these are just some of the references that I, I used there. As I had mentioned uh, at the beginning, um, Today's discussion on faith, uh, well, this, any discussion on faith can sometimes be a little touchy. Um, so I appreciate everyone's um, engagement with that. But what I hope to have had, uh, have brought to, to the discussion was a sense that our own ideas around faith should be less uh, based on what we think and more on, uh, on what we've experienced. I might at this point ask, if any of you remember that first moment uh, with your experience in Buddhism um, or your experience with the Buddha Dharma and, and, and had any sense of a feeling of awe or inspiration, what, what did that feel like? When, when was that? What, what was going on? I had a teacher once tell me that I should never forget that first feeling. Meaning we all will be faced with difficulties, hardships, uh, inconveniences that makes following the Buddhist path that much harder. But what we do during those moments is a reflection of our character. If we call that, uh, call, recall that first feeling, we allow that bodhicitta to shine forth and it can promote charity zeal, patience, concentration, etc. The more we allow it to take the lead, the less we allow ourselves to get in the way. The self doesn't want to let go of control. It's stubborn and pervasive. However, the more we immerse ourselves in each moment with the teachings, we can provide ourselves the validation we need to keep the self in check and to bring the Dharma to life. <laughs> <laughs>